Hey guys, it's your host, Bobby Jones. Today's Thursday throwback episode is going to reintroduce you to a unique investment opportunity that's right up our alley as nurses and healthcare providers. Now, this episode originally aired in February of 2022, but it remains very relevant today. So I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones, and I'm so excited that you're here. The Plan B CRNA podcast is the only show made specifically for nurse anesthetists who are exploring options outside of their traditional career paths. This is the place to expand your mind and your goals as we uncover new ways to produce side income together. Journey with me as I go down various rabbit holes to explore the best Plan B options for you. This episode is brought to you by On Call Capital. On Call Capital is dedicated to educating CRNAs and other healthcare providers about investing outside of the traditional stock market. On Call Capital also provides opportunities for you, yes, you, to create passive income and generational wealth while also lowering your taxable income through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure you do that right now so that you don't miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now on with the show. Welcome to the rabbit hole on the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones. Throughout my journey in finding a Plan B, I've gone down numerous rabbit holes to figure out which ones work for me. Since I've done some of this research already, I only think it's right to bring that information to fellow healthcare professionals to help aid in your search. Now, as always, it's important for you, the listener, to do your own research and form your own opinions. Everyone's situation is unique, and a Plan B that works for one CRNA doesn't always work for another. Self-awareness is the key in any decision you make, since you must have an accurate grasp of your own strengths, weaknesses, and goals. With all of that being said, this is episode number 100 of the show, which I think is a pretty cool milestone to hit. In honor of hitting the century mark, I thought I'd focus on something that's a little more age-appropriate today. That's right. Today's rabbit hole is, dun-dun-dun, senior living. Now, all joking aside, this is a topic that I've wanted to dive into for quite some time. My CNA training and a couple of my nursing clinical rotations were at nursing homes, but I've never really known much about the business side of what makes them tick. I always thought that they were simply owned by a nearby hospital, at least until I really got into healthcare myself. Then I realized that there were specific companies that work in the space. Now, several years ago, my wife, Lorona, worked at a local skilled nursing facility called The Oaks, that was recently purchased by Navant Health, one of our large hospital systems in the area. The Oaks focuses on short-term and outpatient rehab, skilled nursing care, and hospice care. She happened to be in the therapy department, helping post-op patients receiving rehab and older folks as well who were receiving long-term care. It was a nice place to work, but she learned that the place was apparently just bleeding money. It turns out that you can't run these facilities the same way that you run a hospital which apparently was news to the hospital administrators after they purchased it. Fast forward a couple of years, and the hospital system sold the place to Liberty Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services, a company that specializes in running skilled nursing facilities with over 20 locations in the Carolinas. That was really my first introduction to the business of senior living. So I've always had that experience in the back of my mind. You have to have the right management team in place to make ends meet. But upon learning more about real estate, I've realized that there is an entire niche of senior living facilities that you can invest in and profit from. As usual, there are plenty of different ways to get involved, so I'm going to break it down here for you. That way, you can figure out if this is a worthwhile investment for your time, effort, and money. Let's get to it. First, let's look at the opportunity. Right now, the oldest baby boomers are just hitting the age of 75. In 2021, there were 10.5 million Americans aged 82 and older, which is often the age that a person enters into senior housing. By 2030, that number is expected to jump to 15 million as those baby boomers continue to age. As the elderly population is growing, the rate of senior living construction is struggling to keep pace. Units under construction began a significant decline in 2008 and continued to make only modest growth through 2014. Now, from 2014 to 2019, production was certainly increased, but again, 2020 saw that come to a screeching halt with the pandemic. Numbers are ticking back up this year, but according to the American Senior Housing Association, it's estimated that 100,000 units per year will need to be built between 2025 and 2040 to keep up with demand. 
that is a lot of new investment projects every year. But it's important to know also about what you're actually investing in. And the senior living asset class is wholly unique from the others out there because it combines elements of real estate and healthcare management. They are largely high yield, low risk, recession resilient investments. And the economic trends are certainly in favor of market growth. But there are plenty of different flavors in the senior living space. Before you invest in this asset class, you'd better learn more about it. What is it that you need to know? Well, the senior living space itself has six main subtypes. Each one varies on the level of care and services provided and living arrangements with options available for most budgets. Understanding the differences between these subtypes can be helpful as the cost to build, maintain, and manage a facility can vary drastically. Here are the six most common senior living options. Number one, age-restricted communities. This is the option for residents who want to maintain full autonomy while living near like-minded and like-aged individuals. These are communities that are limited to seniors either 55 plus or 62 plus and can be single family homes, apartments, condos, mobile homes, or any combination of those. They can also be rentals or for sale communities. While they don't include any care services, they often have a variety of resident activities to choose from. My grandparents live in one of these mobile home communities down in Florida, and my wife's grandparents lived in Sun City Center, which is an entire housing village in Central Florida. Now, moving on to number two, independent living. This is the lowest care option, as independent living facilities are designed for seniors who want to maintain autonomy, but don't want the responsibilities of home maintenance, daily chores, and cleaning. The main draw here is the ease of life for residents. In large part, they don't have to worry about house cleaning, laundry, activities, and meals because those are all included in the fees for living in the facility. Sounds like my kind of place, to be honest. I mean, I could do with less vacuuming and bathroom cleaning in my life. I don't know about you. All right, moving on to number three, assisted living communities. These are designed for residents who need assistance with some of their activities of daily living, or ADLs for short. Now, this is right up my OT wife's alley as they are the basic physical needs required for everyday life, such as personal hygiene and grooming, dressing, toileting, eating, and transportation. Assisted living offers a congregate living lifestyle similar to independent living with housekeeping meals and individual apartments. The residents living here don't need the intensive care found in nursing homes. And there is a subtype of the subtype here. Okay, residential assisted living homes or residential care homes provide a similar level of care to assisted living facilities, but they're much smaller in size. These are typically converted single family homes located in residential neighborhoods with most care homes housing five to 10 residents compared to dozens or even hundreds in assisted living communities. This can be a welcome feature for seniors who are more shy or wish to keep more to themselves. In fact, there are programs out there that seek to educate everyday folks in building their own residential assisted living business plans. The idea is that you can convert a single family home into a small cash flowing care home to serve those who need help, but maybe they just can't afford the larger facilities with more amenities. One such program, RAL Academy, was founded by Gene Guarino with the idea of teaching and mentoring students across the country. You can find the link to his website in the show notes where you can gain access to his free introductory course. Like with most things, though, you should be prepared to shell out some cash if you want to move further on. The cost is around $1,500 for the RAL Home Study Online Training Course. Next up, number four, memory care. Now, this is often found as a department within an assisted living community, but memory care facilities provide care for patients with Alzheimer's and dementia, as you probably well know. They combine a safe and structured environment with specialized staff equipped to handle the challenges of memory loss residents to provide the care that they need to make daily life easier. Number five, nursing homes. These are unlike other senior living facilities in that they provide skilled nursing services around the clock for residents who simply can't live on their own. These facilities work 24-7 with residents who have physical or mental challenges that prevent a normal living situation, and they're staffed by nurses, physicians, and aides. And finally, number six, continuing care retirement communities, or CCRCs. Now, this one puts it all together in one campus. The idea is to provide a continuum of care so that as residents progress in age and frailty, they can either move to a different section of the community or receive specialized care where they are. 
These are often large facilities with apartments, assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing available. Independent residents may even be able to live in small homes if they don't need assistance yet. CCRCs are complex to run with a large staff needed to manage and maintain everyday activities. Now, this equates to larger overhead and higher cost structures. For residents, there's often a large upfront cost to move in, along with the monthly rent costs. In exchange, residents have access to meal plans on site, as well as numerous daily activities and group excursions. My in-laws have lived in a facility like this for several years now. It's called Givens Estates. It's a Methodist community that's located in Asheville, North Carolina. Even though they are still quite independent themselves, they couldn't be happier with the community, amenities, and overall opportunities provided by the campus. Now that you have an idea of the types of senior communities out there, how do you go about investing in them? As with most real estate investments, there are plenty of ways to go about this. It all hinges on that main decision that you have to make, whether you want to invest actively or passively. Let's explore those two routes. If you want to be active, the most common method for active investment is by purchasing an existing facility or by converting a property, residential or commercial, into an assisted living facility and renting that property to a third-party management company or private operator who then runs the facility. In this instance, the property owner earns passive income from rents while reducing their exposure to the risk and liability associated with operating and managing the facility. Now, if that's not active enough for you, then you can own and operate your own facility. I mentioned RAL Academy earlier, which coaches investors on how to purchase and convert single-family homes into residential assisted living homes. There is a tremendous income potential with taking this direction, but keep in mind that you should have a deep understanding of the laws, regulations, practices, and quality of care required to own and operate a well-run facility before getting started. Yes, this is a real estate investment, but it's also a healthcare business that requires more intensive management than standard multifamily. If you don't want to be active, there are plenty of passive opportunities out there. You can invest in publicly traded real estate investment trusts or REITs that target assisted living facilities within your stock portfolio. The benefits here are the ability to invest smaller amounts of capital, and you're automatically diversified across several properties. Five REITs to keep an eye on are Welltower, HCP, Ventus, Senior Housing Properties Trust, and Care Trust REIT. The nice thing is that you can start investing with very little capital through online brokerages like E-Trade and Fidelity. Each of these has dividend yields around 4% or even higher, but make sure you do your own research. They all have differing amounts of senior housing exposure, with some dipping their toes into medical offices, research facilities, and other property types. You can also invest passively with crowdfunding websites like CrowdStreet, YieldStreet, and RealCrowd. Many of these are investments in specific properties, but there are some funds available that invest in multiple properties. Minimum investments on these sites are commonly around $25,000. You'll have to be patient too, as I've noticed that senior housing opportunities don't really come up very often on these sites. The next option is to invest directly with an experienced operator doing specific projects. This is the method that I took to get started. Some larger operators offer a fund model with options for equity, income, and 1031 exchanges. An example of this is the Senior Living Fund, which is linked in the show notes. Or you can find experienced operators to invest with, although those can be a bit challenging to find. If you're interested in taking this route, one of the leading authorities in the space is Doug Fullaway of 14 Plus. He works to link investors with experienced operators for great returns. I'll provide his link below as well. Of course, no analysis would be complete without looking at the pros and cons. Let's do this thing. First is a con, high operating costs. Those are common, even with properties that are geared more towards independent living. Usually people who move into assisted living facilities need regular medical attention and nursing care. That requires additional staffing, which continues to rise in cost. The pandemic also contributed to rising costs with the addition of personal protective equipment, enhanced cleaning, and ongoing testing for staff and residents. This added complexity makes experience management a real must in the space. Now, next is a pro. Senior housing is needs-based. When investing in real estate, the goal is to earn income from residents. The people who live in senior housing need the services and amenities that are being provided. This results in steadier, less volatile rent growth overall. Con, well, locations can be an issue. 
Most people think that an area with a high concentration of aging adults would be a logical place to invest in senior housing, and it very well may be, but demand can be more nuanced than that. And it's often driven more by the location of a senior's adult children. Those children can often become primary decision makers as it pertains to whether or not their parents move into a facility. Now, investors should consider both age cohorts when evaluating potential demand for senior housing. With higher demand, you're more likely to see a positive return on investment. Of course, other factors like economic conditions, nearby hospitals, population size, and the like can influence the risk of the investment. Next is a pro. It's relatively recession resistant. The overall economy can have an outsized impact on certain investment types and virtually none on others. Older adults will always need housing, and we haven't really figured out how to beat father time yet, making investments in assisted living facilities relatively stable. Senior housing shows high rates of annual returns at the three-year, five-year, and 10-year markers. And in fact, senior housing was the only commercial real estate class that showed positive rent growth during the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. Next is a con. Regulatory changes can affect costs and rental collections. Monthly rental payments can exceed $10,000 per month, but the median household income for those age 75 and above is under $30,000. Now, while many will draw from savings and retirement accounts, selling their personal homes, and utilizing long-term care insurance policies, Medicaid can still play a role in how the rent is paid. Also, changes in state laws can impact the number of nurses working each shift or any number of other factors with a the facility. These can all impact the operating costs and net income that a particular facility produces. Pro, there is a ton of growth potential here. We went over some of the numbers earlier, but the general idea is that the number of seniors in the population is increasing every year and is projected to continue doing so for the next 15 years. Changes associated with aging, such as loss of mobility or the development of chronic illnesses, means that more and more people will be looking at senior housing at some point in their lives. Plus, folks are living longer, with medications being used to better manage long-term conditions. That means more potential residents for the various levels of care facilities. Con, there's a reliance on property management. The business model for senior living is dramatically different from other real estate because it's a hybrid model of multifamily real estate and regulation-heavy healthcare. You're not only investing in the property, but the people running the day-to-day -day operations. They'd better know what they're doing if you're going to make profits. Now, last is our final pro. The senior living market is highly fragmented, primarily because it's highly localized. Being a successful operator takes an intimate knowledge of the local market, a robust marketing strategy, and the right physician relationships. Because regulations change between states, there are plenty of inconsistencies between facilities. Local and regional operators can thrive while national operators may have a harder time. But this also means that there are some mom-and-pop facilities out there that could benefit from more efficient management as well. Now, as you can see, there are plenty of reasons to be excited about a potential senior living investment. While there are also plenty of risks, I think that we as healthcare providers are the best equipped to be able to understand these business models and accurately judge the risk to benefit ratios of such an investment, active or passive. I truly believe there's plenty of profit to go around no matter how you decide to get involved here. Personally, I'm excited to be able to learn more about this niche and build relationships with reputable operators to bring these types of investment opportunities straight to you. There are a couple of books that may help you out as you seek to learn more about senior living and the facilities out there. The first one is The Insider's Guide to Investing in Senior Housing, America's Best Financial Opportunities for the Next 25 Years by Gene and Jim Guarino. Now, this is the definite and definitive handbook for those wanting to discover how to best capitalize on the massive demographic shift known as the silver tsunami, showing readers how to participate as active or passive investors. The next one is Disrupting the Status Quo of Senior Living, A Mind Shift by Jill Vital Awesome. She challenges readers to question long accepted practices, examining their own biases about growing older and working towards creating vibrant cultures of possibility and growth for elders. Lastly, there's Investing in Senior Living, Earning Solid Returns in a Growing Market While Improving the Lives of Seniors by Doug Fullaway. This provides key information needed to understand the growing senior living sector in the United States. 
Now, make sure you check out the show notes for this episode. They are jam-packed with great resources for you to comb through, plenty of links in there for you to take a look, okay? And that's going to do it for today's episode. As always, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Plan B CRNA podcast, and I hope sincerely that you stick around for the next 100 episodes. If you found value today, make sure you hit subscribe so that you don't miss any future episodes. I also want to hear from you. If you have a question, comment, or rabbit hole topic that you'd like me to cover in an upcoming podcast, make sure you rate and review on your podcast player. I check those all the time, and I cover those questions in future episodes. If you'd like to know more about me, make sure you find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, or visit my website at www.oncallinvestments.com. This is Bobby Jones signing off. Until next time, be safe and take care of each other out there. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed the show, I'd be honored if you took the extra time. It really helps to expand our reach and get the word out about the show. If you're a CRNA who is interested in sharing your story on our podcast, I'd love to have you. Please email me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com for more information. This episode was brought to you by On Call Capital. They are dedicated to helping providers like you develop passive income and generational wealth through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. Feel free to check out their website at www.oncallinvestments.com and subscribe to their free educational email series. You can find On Call Capital on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our YouTube page where you'll find all of the show episodes along with other educational videos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.